Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's move into our conversations for this morning. They're mostly centered around the NSARS memorial and the question is, what has changed since October 2020? We're speaking this morning with a couple of people. Um, in studio we have a, a broadcaster and of course um, a, a journalist also, Trust, who's joined us. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Hi, good morning. It's, it's a pleasure being here. Yeah, uh, Trust was a part of the uh, um, you know, documentation of the events from last year and of course it was also uh, involved with yesterday's events. Uh, we also have joining us via Zoom, uh, the National Publicity Secretary, African Action Congress, uh, Femi Adeyeye. Morning, uh, Ms. Adeyeye, thanks for joining us. Good morning, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Nigerians, thank you. Great to have you. But just before we get into the conversation, we would, of course, uh, play a quick report from what happened yesterday. Um, so much, of course, that was covered by our cameras and by cameras of other uh, reporters. And in the process of some of all of that, we also had our, one of our reporters almost injured in the process, uh, running from the tear gas canisters that were fired. We'll play a quick report for you, and then we get into the conversation after this. Now we are live at the NSAS, um, at the to Lekki Toll Gates, the protest ground. And surprisingly, the whole place is filled up by protesters. Right behind me are security um, operatives guiding the protesters from coming further, you know, so that passerby and motorists will be able to ply the route without any hitches. There was a massive gathering this Wednesday morning at the Lekki Toll Gate. It looked like a transfer of aggression, of pain and anguish. The protesters rallied on food and in vehicle procession, causing some gridlock earlier in the day. While the police were stationed at the toll gate for security, lawyers for the answers movement and other activists advised the protesters to vacate the scene as they foresaw a situation where the process would be hijacked. The point is that we have made the point. They said don't come out and, and we came out. Yeah, yeah. It is good time to leave. It's not good for we youth now to move out of uh, Lekki Toll Gate because we can see now a lot of Ulyons being sponsored by the politician, so they will not adjust the protest. The protesters were undeterred as they make their demands known. Let them free all the protesters. Let Let the protesters. We, want to, we need end bad government. The Nigerian government should swallow their pride and come out and apologize to the people. My friend died at Ukwebi Island. They shoot me through my element. I'm a dispatch. Look at me very well. There are still over 300 protesters in prison. Now, I'm calling them protesters, but all of them are not even protesters. Some of them are just bystanders. Some of them are just going to work. And after a year, not one soldier has been put to book. Alas, gunshots could be heard. The police fired tear gas canisters at protesters in a bid to disperse the crowd. They started shooting up. The Commissioner of Police, Hakim Odumusu, made an appearance. He explained the reason for his men's action. Today is a working day for God's sake. Today is a working day. This is the economy of not only Lagos, of the country. Victoria lies behind us. Some protesters were reportedly arrested as the police had warned that anyone seen at the toll gate without an ID card will be arrested. Destiny Momo for Plus TV Africa. Well, um, the scenes from uh, yesterday and um, all that um, uh, took place. Uh, of course, uh, we still have other reporters who will be sharing with you as we um, have this conversation. But I I'm going to start, you know, the conversation from uh, speaking with uh, Trust uh, Inonse, who's a journalist and a broadcaster also, and uh, was a part of the, the uh, protest, so well, part of uh, um, documenting uh, events from last year and, of course, yesterday also. Um, Mr. Inonse, good morning. Thanks for joining hey, us. Hey, good once morning. Again. Good morning once again, Nigeria, Africa and beyond. Uh, the, the question really is, you know, what really has changed um, between last year and today? Um, so, so let's start with, you know, from what you saw last year and right. you know, um, what you experienced last year and of right. course uh, uh, yesterday also. Okay, so uh, clearly, and, and it, is, it, is, it is very, very revealing and um, it, in my memory it's really, really vivid. Because last year when I went to Surya to cover the protest, immediately I stepped out and started shooting. So that, that incident in my head was more or less like, you know what, what would have happened if I was still in the on, on ground at Suleri, right? 
So moving on from there to now, when I was in, uh, when when I, I definitely was on ground again at Lake it all gets, it's, it's pathetic and it's really, really annoying to, to say that I don't think anything has changed. And this, this transcends into other facets of our existence as Nigerians where we necessarily don't understand that we should learn from mistakes, right? Um, Lekki Togit happened October 20 last year. This year, October 20 again, there is no lesson learned. It's more or less like if it would be the way of solving any issue for the police force and the extension, the government, seems to be false. Once it's not forced, they have no other negotiation chip to order to negotiate with the people. And that tells the fact that the only negotiating chip that you can use for your citizenry in Nigeria and even in better climes are good governance. And to the extent of that negotiating chip can't be actualized through these governments, then they use the other means, which is force. From last year to this year, they, I, I, I think personally that they're not yet ready to, uh, to adopt or employ the negotiating chip of good governance. And all they still want to continue to do is brutal force, which is definitely, definitely appalling. Okay. Uh, let's get Femi Adeye on. Femi Adeye, can you hear me? Uh, yes, clearly. All right. So you were on ground yesterday. I, I, I like that you share your experience with us. What was it like being at the toll gate yesterday? All right. I will start by saying um, what happened yesterday is a victory in itself. It's a victory for the Nigerian people um, in which that there would never be a time when the Nigerian people would surrender their freedom. Uh, would surrender their resistance or the altar of any intimidation or threats. Um, that's why the threat by the police, by soldiers, DSS, and every other person. Nigerian people, the young people of this country came out to say, see, this is our rights. Our rights to associate, our rights to freely express ourselves without intimidation and, you know, any of your violent repression would have to be there. And that was what happened. It's a victory in itself. But then it's just to tell us that nothing actually has changed in the operation of the Nigerian police force, the way they, you know, address issues. Nothing has changed. You would all, you would see how you know journalists were being harassed, you know, beaten, people were being beaten, thrown into vans, and all of that. In fact, what I consider very, very shameful in the 21st century democracy is that a journalist would come to a protest ground with helmets and bulletproof vests, as if you're covering a war zone. It's very. I never. I don't. I do not think even during the military. It was this bad. As you can see in the video you're playing, it, there's a journalist putting on the bulletproof and, 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 a, and a helmet zone. You're not covering a war zone in Syria. And you can also tell from how the police officers are showing force and everything. It shows that nothing actually has changed. And we are not surprised at the African Action Congress. We are not surprised because it has always been our position that until you pull down the system that continues to breed and you know produce breath oxygen to all forms of brutalities, we are going nowhere. When we are done with police brutality, we will pick military brutality. When we are done with that, we will pick EFCT brutality. In fact, what I call economic brutality is also with us. All forms of brutality will not live until we obtain that system that is producing all of these brutalities. And that is the work for every young person who is listening to this, who is also part of the NSAS movement. It, so it sounds like a, a, a lot of work uh, uh, that needs to be done, you know, and obviously it may not be achieved in a few weeks or in a few months. There's also those who have said, you know, the best way to achieve this, uh, you know, uh, change is um, through the electoral process. Uh, but hopefully we get to that, you know, angle before we wrap up. Um, Akin Olawoye, we had spoke, uh, spoken with you yesterday. Uh, you were on ground at the protest, uh, uh, the memorial yesterday. Uh, share with us, you know, exactly how it played out and, you know, your, your feelings uh, seeing the events from yesterday. All right, good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, it was quite a remarkable outing yesterday by many of Nigerians. Um, a few of us had figured out that, uh, you know, leading up to the exper experiences from last October, I was at the toll gate, witnessed the shootings, uh, spent the last few months helping a lot of the survivors through the judicial panel in Lekki and really working with the lawyers and making sure that we kept the state government as well as the federal government on its toes with seeing that we had an outcome for justice. Waiting on the panel from the report of Lekki 
is a key thing every Nigerian should make sure this government fulfills ultimately. Yesterday's outing by young Nigerians showed that, again, they are not misguided, they are not hoodlums, they are not out to destroy a city and a country that they love. What you saw was a full display of patriotism. I don't think in the history of this country we have ever seen Nigerians display that much patriotism while expressing grief, sorrow from an event that really kept a lot of people in a very dark mental state. I dare say this, I think for the police force, I would not go out on a limb and criticize 100%. I think there was some level of restraint that was shown. However, we have to utilize opportunities like this to really coach and mentor our police force in understanding how to deal with the public in issues of protest. So again, uh, a few uh, experiences experience that made me feel somewhat uh, disheartened and disappointed, but I think overall people were very, very restrained, people were well behaved. Uh, for the most part, it was supposed to be an 8 to 10, um, you know, auto rally where we drove through the protest, dropped flowers, dropped flags to memorialize, mem memorialize the lives of those that were lost, and I think uh, it was successful. In addition to that, um, we also had in Lagos uh, on a panel at the Sarasuke Summit two mothers of deceased protesters that went on camera, faces not blurred, and really spoke about the grief and sorrow of losing children at the toll gate. One of them picked her son in the morning in the wee hours and had him buried. Another mother is looking for the body of her deceased son. If you recollect the video of the kid bleeding from the neck with a flag and was being prayed for, I have the mother here in Lagos. So again, we're not just only memorializing those that were killed, but we're equally asking the state government, we need you to stand up, show accountability, and produce the corpses of the young kids that were killed last October. Mm. All right, let's get back to uh, Trust Sean, who's still here with us in the studio. Now, you're a journalist, right. and uh, it's a good thing that you were out, you know, uh, during the first time, I mean, in 2020, right. uh, trying to document all that happened. Now, we have constantly seen journalists being harassed right. and manhandled in the course of discharging their duties. Right. How does this make you feel as a journalist? It makes me feel terrible because um, I was also harassed yesterday at the Mileki Toll Gate, right? Right in my car. So at the, right at, at my company's car, at the point where uh, they started like throwing tear gas canisters at people. Of course, we ran into our, our, our car and we had to rescue about one or two people inside our own car. And that was when the police came and dragged me and trying to drag me into the van. And I'm like, like chill, you, you can see my vest. Like my vest is clearly marked my, 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 my company. And I showed him my ID card after a lot of drag before he let me go. And that goes to show you that these individuals are not ready to change. And, and this, is, this is me a little bit dis, um, disagreeing with, um, I think as Mr. Akin said that there was a little bit of restraint from the police. I think that that can be, that can be dubbed as restraint. The only restraint we witnessed yesterday was not use of gun, the, the, not use of, of, of bullets. And as far as I'm concerned, you see the Uber driver that was badly beaten and battered. I, I saw that personally. I saw a lady who did nothing that I still managed to go, I got her out of the van. I saw all of these beating and battery of people. I saw the police officers take people out from the road. These are people that are not even protesters. And this is a, this was a situation where the protesters had gone. Like, and you, you're still picking up people that were just walking through the streets, um, through the toll gates. I don't think that was restrained. I think that that is still the height of, 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 at, at, I'm, I'm trying to mind the adjectives to be perfectly honest, but as a journalist, as someone who always will continue to put himself on the line for the people, reporting the people, the only joy I got yesterday was the appreciation I got for people from passers-by and from listeners and for everyone that I was there to cover the protest and putting my life on the line. It's, it's so pathetic that at the point when I want to go and cover a protest, I'm thinking of, of it as me putting my life on the line for Nigeria. We saw the yellow vest in, 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 in France. We even saw the Black Lives Movement in the United States. We saw protests about the fuel hike in, 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 in the UK. We don't see the um, journalists thinking of pr um, protest as their life being in danger. And we deserve to be that bridge between the people and the government. And if they want us to discharge that duty, that is to show that they need to understand that they can't continue to brutalize journalists when doing their jobs. 
Well, um, I don't think anyone is, you know, safe, you know, from, you know, a, a person who decides to use maximum force for, you know, whatsoever reason, you know, they, they imagine. Um, from, if I may, Ade, I want to so come back to you uh, to share also, you know, what you think must be done, you know, since, you know, from what, from the events yesterday and from the things that we've also seen, not very much has changed with the attitude of the police towards uh, the Nigerian citizen. Um, we also saw um, staff of the Lagos State uh, Neighborhood Watch, I think that, that's the, what they're called, also getting involved with the harassment of people who were passing. People were arrested for simply carrying, you know, the Nigerian flags. Um, you know, I saw early this month that as much as 30 people had to be um, released on bail late last night uh, for reasons I really don't know. So, Femi Ade, what would you say must be done if we want to actually see a difference? All right. Um, I think we should not mean words at all when giving the Nigerian police a heavy no. It's what happened yesterday is still brutality. You know, it wasn't any restraint or any soft hand at all. It was brutality. Another thing I need to add before I talk about what needs to be done is that, you see, you cannot beat a child and then want to determine how the child will cry. It is only in this part of the world you beat a child and then you cover the child's mouth. That's you. If I hear him, you understand, you know, African parents do that. And that is what the Nigerian police would always do. And the Nigerian states, after beating the child, you tell the child not to cry. Then you tell the child where to cry. And just stay in your cars. And that was what happened yesterday. So, uh, you know, it was a very good, it turned out to be, be a very good um, strategy. But, you see, we must not fall into that trap where we allow the states to determine where we cry, when to cry. Because I heard Mr. Akin Lawe saying 8 to 10, and then everybody should disperse. I do not think we should fall into that trap. We continue to, you know, show resistance, and we all have the moral duty to disobey any unjust law and all that. That's being said. And so on what should be done, you see, where I come from, and the kind of background, you know, ideological background I come from, we understand, we look at things from the roots of the problem. You see, what I have said, even on my Facebook post recently, is that we do not have police officers in Nigeria. We have police investors. That, that's the truth. And I will give you an example to that. From the recruitment, look at the recruitment to the remuneration to how they are being posted to promotion and every other thing. You can see that we do not have people who are solely interested in protecting the people. I have on good you know, accounts the amount some of these police officers pay so that they could be posted to SAS units or where they call juicy places. So if a police officer pays as high as 500,000 Naira to be posted to a juicy place, what do they call juicy place? Places where you have young people, where they can rage, where they can do all sorts of things. So that person is not a police officer anymore. He's an investor because if he has paid 500,000 Naira as, you know, as an investment, he must recoup his investment. You go into a DPO's office and you find out that he's the one who bought his desk, he bought the um, air condition, he did everything, he quit his office. This man must make his money back. And how, must he, how will he make it back? He would have to rage. He would have to beat up people. He would have to lie against um, innocent people. So it is a systemic issue. And until we face the roots of all of these problems, we will keep psychomambulating. We will come back here next year to talk about brutality. For example, immediately you leave, like I said earlier, if you leave police brutality, you also go back to, um, you know, recently we also, the end, EFCC. Because of the brutality that is also being made on young people in the EFCC. In this part of the world, we must understand how to build institutions. Institutions that, even if we have the worst people in those institutions, the laws guiding those institutions, we prune them to sanity. But if we do not go to the root of all of these problems, we will just keep scratching the face. See, you cannot continue doing, you know, painting a house or doing POP in a house that has a bad, bad foundation. And until we pull down that system that continues to build all of these brutalities, we would not have, you know, a conclusive end. We would always come back to the streets to protest, to protest, and to protest. And then we would, have, we would always have to call... Um, at the end of the day, when people are harassed, when people are sitting there, you have compensation, you start going to a panel, and you also know what happens to a panel anyways. But yeah. 
this is another this is another um, another one in front of us that we would not i'm not saying we should discountenance what's happening in the panel i was part of the panel discussion i, I always attended the panel and i would also the the, the panelists have you know they've done a very good job in the uh, listening to petitions and all that the work is just so enormous and what what we're waiting for is that there must be a conclusive end especially to the Lekki massacre reports and no nigeria should go to sleep until that report is out all right. Can I come in? Uh, yeah, hold, on. hold on before hold on. I, uh, you know we come to you. But we'd like to take a, a look at this uh, particular response from the Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed, saying that you know uh, that the uh, persons were killed. The massacre is fake news, and nothing really happened. Let's just take a, a look at this uh, response from the minister. The military did not shoot at the protesters at the Lekki toll gate on October 23, 2020, and there was no massacre at the toll gate. The only massacre recorded was in the social media. Hence, there were neither bodies nor blood. Two, Amnesty International, CNN, and Runaway DJ, and the runaway DJ and others like them should apologize for misleading the world that there was a massacre at the Lekki toll gate and for portraying the Nigerian military, police, and other security agencies in bad light. Three, CNN acted unprofessionally by relying on unverified and possibly doctored social media videos as well as other open source information to conclude that the massacre took place at the toll gate. All right. Uh, just to share with you uh, uh, the uh, Minister of Information and, of course, his, his uh, thoughts towards the October 2020 um, you know, happenings. Uh, we're now going to bring back uh, Aki Olaoye. Um, I want you to start your response from there. Um, the minister still says that nothing, and no, there was no massacre. Probably nobody was killed also. CNN, DJ Switch, and Amnesty International need to apologize to Nigerians. Um, Akin, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I think, you know, when we look at leadership in this country, we deserve a country in which um, we, we ought to understand that there is value to each and every Nigerian life. And I say that with a lot of sense speaking. Uh, my previous comment about the police and restraint, let me just correct that, uh, not to offend anyone watching. I think what we saw yesterday uh, in this what was this cable. Uh, I was only speaking of my experience as a whole. And again, uh, using this opportunity, police a glow view for someone takes my feedback and run off with it. But then I'm only saying uh, we can see improvements and we need to see more. The right to protest is an alienable right every Nigerian ought to be able to uh, exercise. Back to what the minister said, as I stated earlier, um, here in Lagos, we have two mothers grieving, um, one with a documented video with metadata timestamp putting the death of her son at the toll gate, a second kid that was killed, the mother picked up the corpse, buried the kid the same morning of the shootings, how are you going to have me sit here and listen to what the Honorable Minister is saying and don't take him seriously? Let me even start by mentioning names of deceased protesters. Victor, Victor Ibanga, I'm Sunday Okon, Victor Ibanga, Oleko, Abata Solomon. I can go on and on and on. We have five known deceased protesters at the scene of the toll gate. We have four bodies, pictures taken of people who died. We have recorded evidence at hospitals and the statement from the chief pathologist showing bodies brought to hospitals across Lagos the night of the shooting. We have eight survivors, another 14 more with bullet wounds. So if over 15 people sustained bullet injuries, how many more were not fortunate to make it to a hospital and lay dead at the, at the programs? And then you say it was bloodless? I mean, somebody help me here. I'm just, I'm short of words. Femi, I think you also want to share your thoughts on that one. Trust will come to you. Yes, definitely. You see, Nigerians have been so insulted over time. 
Um, and this minister continues to be the, the chief insulter of the intelligence of Nigerians. First is that you will so be also a live video. I do not know anywhere in the world where a live video is being video shot until when you know the case of Nigeria you know happened, this lucky massacre. And then another thing is that so many lies have been told in the course of this whole issue. And these lies are always pointing to the truth. I was at the Lekki, you know, uh, panel, and when um, I met um, Taiwo, the Brigadier General Ahmed Taiwo, who came to represent the Nigerian Army, when he came, he also agreed that they were at the Lekki toll gates. The governor said he, um, the soldiers, because these are reports that everyone can, you know, pick up. He said the soldiers were at the Lekki toll gates. The ACP. Um, I've forgotten his name, the police representative was also there. I alluded to that fact. But at the end of the day, he brought, he, he came just to justify the kind of violence that happened at Lekki Tollgate. He came with a particular video. But when it was played, it showed that the timestamp on that video was in November. That's, uh, 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 that, that video had um, some guys who were um, wielding machetes and every other thing. So uh, when it was shown, superior argument. He said, okay, it was NSAS that gave rise to all of the other violence that were not happening across Lagos. You see, so just to tell you that all of these lies are pointing towards the fact that that place on that on that day, you know, was a blood, you know, it's all, all, everything that happened in that place is just better imagined than you experiencing it. I've met also with some of the victims. Some of them have been permanently injured. Some of them um, are, are still feeling pains in their body. There's this guy I met who still has um, his seventh rib. He, there was an operation that was done on his seventh rib and he still has serious pains there. So when a minister, especially on a day like this, we are in a, in, in a civilized country in the 21st century, if rather than sharing consolation and restitution, you are coming to tell Nigerians that nothing happened and you describe the massacre as phantom. I think Nigerians should, right now from this minute, seek that this minister resigns from office. I think that's the first thing we must do at this time. We are telling Lai Mohammed that he should start putting together his resignation letter because you cannot continue to insult Nigerians with your media wounds. If, um, uh, what's his name? If Lai Mohammed is not insulting us today, Femi Adeshino is insulting us tomorrow. If Femi Adeshino is not insulting us, Garba Shew will be insulting us. You know, this is something we all saw. CNN came up with a, a particular report and then you are not even looking at that. All you have to say is that, and it comes from this arrogance of power, it's, uh, which is also from the system we are talking about. Uh -huh. Until we, we call this, we call it, uh, you know, a shot for these guys. They would co continue rubbing um, all this on our faces. Okay, um, trust. Uh, you can also go ahead. Um, I, I think I think that it's Lai Mohammed. Um, no one should be surprised. Um, it's it's never shocking when Lai Mohammed speaks. Neither is it ever surprising. It just continues to solidify to the fact that most times, in vast majority of instances, the people we have in government are clowns, people who necessarily lack the, the, the intellectual capability to even lie in the first place, right? So the, the honest truth is you need some level of intellect to be able to lie. You don't just, you, you, you can't just come outside and insult people without tactics, without knowledge, without experience, and, uh, and without intelligence. And, 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 and this, this clearly shows that these people are not... See, and see, for you to understand how clownish what he's saying is, someone who, the governor of Lagos State, agrees that they were shooting. Lai Mohammed say there is no shooting. Now the question is, who is the clown? Is it Sawalu or Lai Mohammed? Like it's it's obvious. Then you say that oh, it is for at times at, at times yeah, it is really really imperative. And I think this is something governance should be all about. It is really imperative we understand that there are things we say so that we don't look stupid, right? You can't say this international public that, hey, an IG Live was photoshopped. It is simple. They ask you, how then, where, where was your schooling? How, how then did you, how then were you able to rise to power? It's so annoying understanding that because before the protest yesterday, I knew a friend that called me, I was crying all through how she witnessed the protest and was really begging me not to go cover the protest. And you didn't tell me that there was no massacre, no shooting, nothing. Quick, a police officer yesterday confirmed to me 
that police officer shot at Lekki yesterday. And you didn't tell me there was no shooting. Oh, well. Clownish. All right. Um, um, let's get back to you now, Mr. Akin Ola Oye. Uh, now that the government is saying that there was no massacre, this is all fake news. It's fabricated. What next? Uh, we're going to keep demanding accountability. Uh, there's something that this generation is well positioned for and talented at doing, and that is documenting. We've never seen in the history of this country where events unfold and within minutes or hours, we're not putting out factual information to counter a narrative. I will tell you something is happening, and that's the fact that a lot of victims and their families are beginning to find courage to speak up. We've seen that with two of the mothers yesterday. I'll be glad to equally refer them to come on your program and talk about their experiences and equally demand from the government answers to the killings of their young ones. I would equally tell you that a lot of young Nigerians are saying, hey, enough is enough. We're going to keep pushing. We will keep speaking truth to power. We are not the docile generation that will be silenced. And I can tell you something, anytime more than ever, we've seen a lot of political consciousness and engagement. Watch the PBC registrations go up. People are going to the polls and we will send a message on election day. I don't care who the politician is. People are now ready to say, you know what? You make the wrong move, we're going to hold you accountable. And that's the attitude we need from top to bottom. Um. Femi, um, I think same question to you. What next, you know, and uh, where is this all headed? Um, what can possibly be achieved by a continued um, agitation? Remember also Twitter is still suspended. Um, and, um, you know, the, the platforms for which these conversations can go on, you know, seem to be restricted. All right. I, I totally align my thoughts with uh, Mr. Akinlawe. You see, we cannot say because we tried something and then we got just little consensions and then we abandon it. You know, we must keep pushing. And um, protest is just one out of the many political processes that must, you know, um, be employed if we want to have a free society where we all can, you know, call our uh, country. Uh, NSAS actually is, um, I see it as a movement of citizenship. You know, people tried to become citizens. They tried, they showed, you know, citizenship. Uh, but at the end of the day, they were, you know, killed for that. And so we must remember this in the context of what it is. Uh, NSAS, to me, is one of the biggest, you know, movement that showed accountability and transparency and how governance should be everywhere in the world. You know, at some point when hoodlums were sent, we, we protected ourselves. And that is what you call security. We fed ourselves. That's what you call welfare. And security and welfare are the primary objectives of government anywhere in the world. But these are the things that are what's missing in Nigeria. But we keep pushing, you know, actually, and um, we we'll, uh, keep organizing ourselves, talking to ourselves, and making ourselves involved in all of the political processes, not just a protest. Okay, um, uh, Sean is still here, and I'm directing this question to you because you are a journalist, and the fact that, you know, uh, the media, the press would always be here, especially right. in a democratic dispensation. Right. And because we cannot flee the scene... How then do we go about the job? It's simple. Um, orientation. Um, of course, um, Adeyeye and, and Mr. Akin have spoken very succinctly about electioneering and elections. And for that to happen, there has to be orientation. And that's why I tell my colleagues, like, we all have a job. Go to the grassroots. Talk to people. Let them know that the facade of, oh, your vote don't count and all of this stuff are actually lies. Let them know that no matter how much they rig, once your number is much, you outrig them. So that is the orientation we need to do. We need to start organizing town hall meetings, or start organizing seminars, conferences, start organizing village, village meetings, like just in the city square. Start doing all of those grassroots meetings with people so that they can understand what needs to be done and how it's going to be done. It's not enough. For us to just sit and talk every time. Do you understand? A lot. But, but do you think this in any way would solve the problem of police brutality and harassment? I'm talking now to the profession. And uh, not to say that, uh, I mean, in particular, because even before the protests, we constantly right. see that journalists mm -hmm. and, you know, those in this profession are being harassed. Of course. No, you see, and it's, it's, it's part of it, right? So when you, when you orientate people, when you talk to people about their future, they begin to understand that, 
that for them to gain a future, they have to be a present. And the present now is a struggle. Unfortunately, I don't see any of this ending anytime soon. So we are presently in a struggle. To achieve emancipation, there is a stage for struggle. And that is the stage we are presently. We can't skip the stage of struggle to the stage of eman emancipation, right? So let's, as, let's, let's, let's embrace this struggle, let's embrace this process, and let's realize as journalists that, see, we are here right now, we we'll give all we have for this, and this is all we have right now so that we can achieve the greater good. Uh, Mr. Olawi, I'm back to you. Um, I want to know, because you were out yesterday, um, Mr. Macaroni, I think uh, you were driving with him. Uh, Files was also there, um, FK Abudu, a couple yeah. other people. Um, who else would you say, or what else needs to be done you know, to boost the struggle and to boost uh, uh, the, the amount of, of pressure and the energy around this conversation. Uh, do you need more celebrities? Do you need the church? Do you need the mosque? Do you need traditional rulers? Um, what else needs to come in you know, to support this whole conversation? Sure. As I just say this, everyone is a victim of bad governance. I don't care where you sit on the, you know, on the structure economically, socially, or academically. Uh, some of the names you may be mentioned are people that have been committed to the struggle. They've been there since day one. Uh, they've taken a lot of criticism. Uh, even when they wake up every day to, you know, do things I call selfless, active citizenship. And I think we just need to really understand that it takes all hands on deck. Um, but most importantly, the average Nigerian walking the street is a key stakeholder that's needed to solve this problem. And I think if we all understand that, again, as Nigerians in a constitution, for a country such as ours, as imperfect as it may be, guarantees our certain rights and our ability to exercise those rights every single day we wake up, leave our homes, is something that should not be deprived from any one of us. In terms of pushing forward and really seeing that, again, we, we have a larger tent, bring more people. Again, if you, there are a lot of government officials that would leave office and then the veil falls of their eyes and they see these problems that many of us have been speaking to. It doesn't need to take you coming out of that Prado Jeep with police security to really understand what plagues this country. It's all around you. Right now, Nigerians are living way below, you know, what, what you call our, our global standards for, for existence. There's so much hunger and suffering in land, but on top of that, we have to deal with police brutality, we have to deal with, you know, harassment of citizens, violation of human rights. I say this, everyone is needed in this struggle, and I think until we get to that promised land, we won't stop fighting. Mm. All right, um, I, we still have Mr. Femi. Uh, Mr. Femi, do you think that this is a time where we should be talking about state police? Because uh, I'm thinking, uh, how do we now address this issue? At the end of the day, uh, arguments would be that the government or state governors, uh, they don't really control the police architecture in their state. So um, should we be talking about you know, state policing? Maybe that might help in reducing police brutality. But, but add, add um, your thoughts or bring this into your thoughts also when you respond. In all yeah. your state, there was a protest yesterday, but the energy was totally different. Uh, there was uh, pictures and videos. They had their memorial. They had their candlelight uh, procession. They were um, escorted by the police. Um, uh, so, so, you know, Femi, share with us, you know, what this means and, you know, how, you know, all this really is different in different states. All right. Um, this issue about police brutality, we cannot discuss it in isolation, but from state to state. Because when you have, like what you said, state police, uh, it does not change the brutality. You know, you just, at the end of the day, you're just adding a particular adjective to the brutality. Then it becomes state police brutality. It's as simple as that. Uh, we, like I said, we go to the root of all of those things, which is that there is just a system that is making sure that all of these things do not work. A system that places, you know, profit over people. Is a, a system that does not see humanity as how it should be. If you're talking about state police, let me tell you, there are 11 NSAS protesters who are still languishing in detention in all your states, where you have the best governor, Sheyi Makinde, you know, the best thing that has happened um, since they were going. And you know, he's, he's the best governor right now. But 11 protesters are still languishing in detention. In Kirikiri, you have 300, you know, languishing in detention. 300 people who were picked um, during um, NSAS and, 
um, post enters, I mean, when I mean post enters, I mean 21st of October yeah. 2020. People will just buy standards and all of that. So, if you talk about state police, maybe if we, we, we make uh, police um, closer to the governor, and the governor then determines uh, who becomes the commissioner and all of that, um, maybe police brutality will go. No, it will not go because the system that gives rise to all brutality is still very much around. And that is also something, something we also see about elections. You see, under in elections, there are two questions we must always ask ourselves. Whom to change and what to change. So whom to change answers the question of personalities. You, maybe if you change one very good guy for a bad guy or a bad guy for a good guy, something will change. No, it's, it's just a, a step. That is the first question. And that was what happened in 2014, 2015. Everybody wanted to chase out the PDP for the APC. Maybe let's chase out, you know, Jonathan for Buhari, you know, the disciplinarian, the incorruptible, and many, many other accolades that were given to him. But till today, we can now see, you know, what history has brought before us. Now, the what to change question is the system that we run, which is the political system and the economic system that places, you know, uh, profit over people. Until we crush that system, if you like, bring the most incorruptible guy into that system, the guy is going to mess up big time. And that speaks to right. what you're saying about state police. Uh, okay. State police. Um, we, have a, we have another uh, quick report to share with you. And this is, um, you know, from our reporters on ground yesterday, uh, what they experienced. And uh, we, we'll talk about it right after this. So quickly watch this. I heard a sound. I was like, is this a gunshot? What is this? And people started running. And then it became intense. They continued. I am a cameraman. We started running. We're crossing the road at the other side of Lekki Toll Gate, where the cars were, were coming with so much speed. We were crossing. We didn't care. And I was praying. <coughs> I saw some other people going through a barbed wire into the, the, water, the waterways, where the water was around the Lekki Toll Gate. And I, I looked at it. I weighed it. I viewed it. And I saw that it was... I, I, I might not be able to fit in to that barbed wire. I started digging sand. It was as if I was swimming inside sand just to be able to pass through the barbed wire that would help me make way into the waterways. And then people were like, my camera, I saw my camera on the ground. I was like, God. As I was carrying the camera, people were shouting, leave the camera and run. Your life is more important. Leave the camera and run. And other people were asking us not to pass through where the barbed wire because they were scared that the police would start coming and then they were driving us. And I had to lie that I was pregnant. Because of my size, they believed me. And before I edit, I was here shooting tear gas and all. I don't know what, what they were shooting, but I know I was hearing sounds and everything. So I, I picked up to my ways. I was running with my camera and my reporter was running as well. So as we were going, what it would make me feel so bad was that this um, tear gas was so, so, um, so powerful as in I felt uncomfortable. You know, I was choking, I was crying, what was coming out, my eyes was red, you know, I couldn't breathe very well. It was like I was going to give up. That was how I felt like, man, I was going to go at that moment, you know. So as I was going, my camera fell down, you know. Yes. I left my camera, not because I don't want to pick it up, but I was, bread was leaving me already. I was, feeling, I was feeling weak already at that moment. So I had to call my MD. Like, sir, this is it. This is what's happening at the moment. I was still panting. I was feeling comfortable. It was like, okay, where's Destiny and where are the other guys? I said, I don't even know where Destiny is at the moment. And I left my camera at the scene. But my MD is a very lovely man. And he was like, okay, now about the camera. About, am I okay? Am I good? I said, I'm, I'm okay. I'm good. So after everything, after like 30 minutes, I went back to the scene. I had to trek back to the scene. This is not the first time I'm, I'm coming to protest, but this one was so intense in the scene because of the tear gas and everything. It was going into my system. I felt uncomfortable. I was passing out totally. So um, but glory be to God, you know? Yeah. I'm still talking to you. I'm still feeling uncomfortable. I'm feeling, I'm feeling funny in my system. Some people were harassed. Me, myself, I was harassed by the Nigerian army because he almost took my phone from me. I was on my Instagram live and he said I should stop filming because at that time they were harassing some people in a bus. They were destroying the Nigerian flag, they pushed them, they tore their shirts and all that. So I was trying to capture that moment and all that when the Nigerian army came and almost took my phone from me. So all I had to do at that time was to, you know, hibernate my phone at that time so they wouldn't even know I was filming, you know, just to get those moments and a few minutes later, they started shooting the tear gas on some people and... 
All right. Um, with the time we have left, I think we can just uh, take final thoughts from um, all three of our guests. So I'll start with you, Trust. And then it became... Final thoughts. We just have to do better. Let's know we have to do better. And as a journalist, I want to speak more to journalists. Uh, in Nigeria today, unfortunately, the executive had failed Nigerians. The legislative has failed Nigerians. The judiciary has failed Nigerians. That's supposed to be the home of the common man. We are supposed to be the fourth estate of the realm as journalists. Are we also going to fail Nigerians with maybe bribes and brown envelopes and all of this stuff? We shouldn't let that happen. Let's be the person or the organization or the people that ensure that we bring the news accurately to Nigerians. Let's try. Let's not fail this country. And uh, let's hope we have a better country moving forward. All right, um, Mr. Day, you can go ahead. All right, final thought is um, to all Nigerians, especially the young people who form the largest demography. And it is so the understanding that this country belongs to all of us. Uh, we must all stand up at this time and never should we fall into the trap of uh, dropping our resistance for those who are oppressing us. Never, never. There should never be a time when we all be captured silence. Uh, despite their intimidation and threats, let's always make sure that we find you know, strategies um, to always protest injustice. You know, there, there are times anyways that you may get you know, weary. It's understandable. When you, know, when you wake up every morning and everything you see about Nigeria is bad news and all of that. And then this uh, syndrome of running, you know, escaping the country, then keeps you know, coming alive every day. But we should understand that those places we're going to, people fought you know, to make those societies sane. And uh, we must not leave our own society. We must stay put here and make sure that we fix this country because it belongs to all of us. Um, I can't allow you. And just to add, uh, I appreciate all the great work many of you are doing, even in the face of what I call tyranny and pushback from a government that's relentless in pushing propaganda. I uh, can only count on you all to keep doing this very difficult work. I will say this on the microphone. Being an active citizen does not make you an activist. I think every Nigerian should wake up active every single day, demanding more from this government, demanding accountability, speaking truth to power, and making sure that until we have a country where I don't have to pick up my green passport to feel like I'm in a blessed environment, I don't think we should rest. And lastly, to many young people out there, this is the time to take control of your country. We're not going to have the old generation write the rules for our generation. Every generation writes its rules. From everything you've seen, where they are clamping down on young people's ability to prosper, to succeed, to really make the best out of themselves, we have to own the future. Start with you getting your PVC. Stay active. Stay engaged. Don't wait till it's your problem before you speak up. Be part of the struggle. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation. We really do appreciate your time. And this is where we call it a wrap. Thank you so much for joining us as well. We'll definitely continue tomorrow. And to catch up on all of the conversation, just in case you missed out, do not forget to follow us on uh, our Instagram page, Facebook and Instagram is at Plus TV Africa, and on YouTube is at Plus TV Africa. I am Messi Boko. Do have a great day. And I am Osao Gye Ogbawa. See you tomorrow.